Oh, let's hit it, babe. Let's hit it, baby. Don't call me, baby. You gotta poop. It's gonna be a poop you, cast. Oh, poop cast. In. No, just go right now. It's fine. No, I don't. Because by the time I get there, I won't have to go, and then I'll come back, and then it'll, I don't want to disappoint myself, you know. <laughs> Wake up, everybody. Today is August 20th, and we are Never Free to Play, a podcast where we talk about all the video games we wish we were playing. I'm one of your hosts, Karch Palashi, joined by my co-host, Jason Wright. If you decide you like us and want to see more of my exasperation on camera, you can find us at neverfreetoplay.com, patreon.com, slash neverfreetoplay, or on all other social media where we are Never Free to Play. If you have questions, comments, thoughts, ideas, feedback, please send it to us at neverfreetoplay at gmail.com. Jason, how are you doing? Decent. So I think decent. that's the best I can do this week. Decent. I uh I'm learning that I just think I have a fat personality and I'm never gonna overcome it. You know? I do. I know all about your fat personality. <laughs> like seriously, I had an an incredible dinner at my in laws. Uh we had like filet mignon seared perfectly on the big green egg potato salad um that was i don't know two hours ago i could eat another meal just like that right now sure we i don't know to, what my problem is you don't have a problem you're you're alive that's what your problem is <laughs> we talked about this it's life is stress and life is joy and eating and <laughs> I mean, I yeah. went, I went uh, like a, a whole week where I did great. Like I did great. I counted calories every day. Seven days. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't drink as much, you know, I did all the things and then we get into this week and like Monday I was awesome. Tuesday I was like, ah, oh, it's my anniversary. Wednesday I was like, ma, oh, it's game night. And Thursday's like, oh, we're celebrating our anniversary at the in-laws and tomorrow's date night. And then it's Saturday Whatever, just whatever. Just do you be happy, you know. Weight is just a number, just like age. <laughs> Both of those are so <laughs> untrue. <laughs> well, we did have a we had a discussion about facts and opinions, and I guess you're right. Yes, I am. Um, but no, I mean we did the same we went to South Charleston, South Carolina for our ten year anniversary back in March, and for the most part everything that we did revolved around food and it didn't matter how high class that meal was, how filling it was, how delightful it was. If we didn't finish that meal by uh, around 11 PM, we were eating still afterward. I'm only limited by the fact that our hotel room didn't have a fridge. Oh wait, no, it did have a fridge. So we were still eating probably at like midnight. And And that's the problem with this quarantine lifestyle is like, Oddly, every day feels like it's vacation because it's so out of the ordinary. So it's like you're not in your routine. And so like it just feels like there are no rules. You know, there's no structure. You you go to work still on some days, but you work from home other days. So you don't even like it's super topsy turvy. It's so weird. It's bizarre because then like the, the day is where it's like I work from home tomorrow. Well, then I know I can sleep in a little later. Yeah. And so then I stay up a little later and then that's a whole thing because that yeah. becomes exciting. I actually so, just recently kicked, I was get that was getting bad for me. I was getting into a bad spiral, um, but I got out of it and I'm going to bed a little bit before midnight for the most part. I'm waking up around seven, seven thirty instead of, you know, playing magic for two hours and uh, same. I, I did the same thing like um, hmm, the end of June, like, Prior to that, I was staying up to like one or two on nights where I didn't work. Now I'm starting to get into the swing of like, okay, let's try to cut it off around, you know, 1130, 1145. Right. But not tonight. Because tonight we're going all night. It's a shout cast, baby. Shout cast. Wake up, Julian. Shout cast, baby, this evening. It's a shout cast, baby, tonight. Okay. You took it too far. All right. I'm sorry. Housekeeping. <laughs> like, sub, follow. Tell us why you did it, too. That always helps because we ain't got nothing. We don't know what we're doing. Every 40 minutes, Jason sends me a new message that says, hey, I figured out the secret to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I never do. I never and he do. Has it actually figured it out yet? Uh, uh, do it. We are at, at Never Free to Play on all social media platforms. Most active on YouTube and Twitter. Yep. And um, I will have a finally plays for Final Fantasy IX up by the time that this goes up. I haven't done it yet, but I will have it up by then. There is a new episode of NFTP Debates, the Apple versus Fortnite. You can hear Jason and Greg go at it. I haven't actually listened to it yet, unfortunately. So who took what side? Um, I argued in favor of Apple and Greg argued in favor, uh, favor of Fortnite. That sounds right. That sounds right. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm in favor of Apple just off of our conversation from last week, but... You know, Greg often swings me towards his side. Well, rather, you make me go to his side because you're a terrible debater. Oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, we are an indie podcast now, so we will try to only talk about indies, except where we don't. Right, yeah. Well, that's something we're toying with. Yeah. But if you got good indie recommendations, throw them our way. We've probably heard about them because we're such good indie guys, but oh yeah, uh, in case we haven't, it's always nice to hear. All right, Jason, what did we get wrong last week? Okay, I actually didn't see this correction, so you might have to help me out. Um, Jason, start corrections music now. So, uh, Sean tells us that Warhammer is made by Games Workshop. Yeah, I don't even a, know what that, what does that mean, Karch? This is a, there was a clarification, Warhammer, the game, Warhammer 40K, sometimes Warhammer, whatever they call like the fantasy one. So the little models we were talking about, I don't remember why. But we were talking about Warhammer, um, and I couldn't remember who was in charge of it, and Sean was um, nice enough to tell us it was Games Workshop. So. Okay, well, there you go. Only thing we got wrong last week, in the corrections, music. Boo! All right, well, we're going to go ahead and talk about some gaming news, and the hot ticket item this week was there was a Nintendo Indie, what do they call it, Indie World. I don't know if they use the word direct. I use the word direct because that's how they've conditioned me, but they call it Nintendo Indie World. Mm. They don't call them Nindies anymore, which is kind of a shame. Nindies is cute oh, and fun. That's a good pun. What? N- oh, yeah, Nindies is a great yeah, pun. Yeah, Nindies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's go ahead and walk through some of the games that are coming to Switch from independent developers. The cool thing is a lot of these were like kind of like surprise drop, you know, out now. Yeah, a lot of shadow drops, at least three, maybe four, um, especially three or four ch- worth checking out. It wasn't just like, ah, okay, maybe, but no. And, and a lot of them did come to other consoles. We'll try to point out which ones didn't. Um, and a lot of them were available already, but it's still nice when you're like finding out a game's coming to a console that you like, and it's going to be there literally right in that moment. So, first thing up was Supergiant Games it announced that Hades is coming uh, to Nintendo Switch in fall. Uh, Hades is a cool procedurally generated roguelike where you are the son of Hades. I don't remember. I don't think there's a canonical son of Hades in Greek mythology, so it's probably like a character they created all on their own. And um, uh, I'm really stoked because this game's been in early access on the Epic Game Store exclusively for a while, and this is basically their 1.0 official release, and it's coming to all the other consoles as well. Um, but we, and that was probably assumed. You were never sure if they're going to bring it to Switch or not because they, you know, who knows? Sometimes things just don't come to the Switch for some reason. Uh, but it is; it's coming everywhere, and I am super excited. I will be picking this up day one. Oh yeah, and I will be I will be mooching off you day one uh, if we don't go <laughs> have these because this looked uh, uh, like an amazing game. So with Super Giant Games, they also made uh, Bastion and uh, Trans- Transistor, I believe, as well, and, and uh, Empire, and- um, like two or three years ago. Okay, cool. Yeah, but but the thing I liked about this is it, it kind of looked it's so it's it's iso it's isometric. It kind of looks like Children of Morta meets Dead Cells. So more Children of, of Morta in terms of like the way you traverse in the combat because like Dead Cells is more of a a side scroller Metroidvania sort of thing, and this is not that. Um, but in terms of like the vibe that I got from it, it was a little more Dead Cells, and the fact that like once you die, you kind of restart at the beginning, and it's that kind of roguelike. Uh, but then I assume, you know, with this being super giant and the way Bastion was done, it's going to have that nice, like, rich voice narrative going over the, you know, the, the game as you as you're playing. Which also Children of Morn has that as well, mm-hmm. which is is really cool. So, um, anyway, I'm 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 stoked about this. I think it's going to uh, be a fun fun game to get get my hands on. 
Yeah, there's not a lot of quote unquote sure things out there, but by all again, because this has been out for a while, this game has really, I mean, no secrets about it because people have been playing it for like probably over a year now. I think they announced uh, it at last. 2018 year's is when I think the uh, the alpha has started. For okay, so wait, that's two years. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so again, like I'll, the people who we're talking about it, like it's this, like ooh, who knows what's gonna happen? It's kind of like this, even though you could easily go find out exactly what it's like. So go right. do that if you want, but. This is a slam dunk, and by all accounts, this is their best game yet, like, according to everybody. Like, all the things that they do well or have done and introduced in their previous games, like Jason mentioned, with the um, the voiceover and just the really good art styles and aesthetic, they just cranked it up to 11 for this game. And uh, it's, you know, it's a familiar and really fun environment. Like, people love Greek gods. You never get tired of either killing Zeus or helping Zeus, whatever Zeus is up to. And, you know, the same thing with Hades, Poseidon, and all those people. So bring it on. All right. Absolutely. Next was some 90s aesthetic web browser game, which I didn't even get the name of, and it didn't look like something I was ever going to play. Did you catch it? You got no. List? And I'm, no. Um, what, are you talking about Hypnospace? Could be. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it is. It's a 90s internet simulator. Yeah. Um, I, I Not for me. Not for me. But it is I out did. on August 27th. I didn't like the internet in the 90s, so I don't want to go back there. <laughs> Next up was Spiritfarer, which is a kind of super cute, uh, it had like an anime-esque, anime-inspired at least, um, kind of cinematic before it showed the gameplay, which for the most part has the same exact style as the trailer did. It's a management game, so you're going to be you know helping people and building a town or whatever. The theme, though, is that these are spirits, some kind of afterlife, and you're some sort of like fairy man, fairy woman, witch thing. You got this kind of star shaped hat thing. I don't know. It looks weird. It it, it looks very Ghibli inspired too. Studio Ghibli, Miyazaki, all that kind of stuff. Um, I believe that was one that dropped. Yep. It was dropped that day. So it's out now on switch. Um, I really love everything about it. I love the music. I love the way it looked, the concept, you know, I like management games. I like my harvest moons and stuff. I'm going to let it sit on the wish list for a while, though, because these kind of games can be huge time sinks, and I just don't have any of that. So He's got no time. He's Even though we're an indie podcast, he's playing too many AAA games. Too many. Final Fantasy. World of Final Fantasy Maxima. I'm All the drop. Final Fantasy is Final Fantasy IX, Final Fantasy World. Uh, whatever. We'll talk, about we'll talk about it later. Dropping that game. Uh, any comments on Spirit Fair, Jason? No, anime has never been my thing uh, outside of Dragon Ball Z, uh, so and Princess Mononoke. But so no, no love fluke. for me for me on this game. But yeah. uh, next up was Garden Story by developed by Pictogram, which I think might just be one dude. He introduced himself as if he is Pictogram, this is, which is also again the name of the developer or maybe the person or both. I, I don't know. Um, but you are. It looked like you were like some sort of squid octopus thing, but it turns out you're a grape. And oh. then you go, yeah, right. I don't know why. Well, I mean, it makes sense because it's garden story and grapes grow in the garden. But then why did he have like little tentacle legs? Well, what else? They're his vines. What else are you going to move with? But they were like grapey colored. You know Maybe what? I can't, I can't answer it for you because I'm, I'm not pictogram, okay? You're not pictogram. Um, it looked like some sort of crossover between yet yeah, another like kind of semi management game, but also it had seemed to have like these very light action moments in a z- sort of Zelda esque kind of you know world style layout kind of thing. Um, the mission is you have to stave off the rot, whatever that means. Uh, you see, you cl- see clearly moments where like you're picking tools and they do certain amounts of damage, and you have to like you know defeat an enemy here and there, and then you go back to a town and you build up, make a building or whatever. And aesthetic wise, it, it very much looks like a Super Nintendo game, kind of that top down overworld mm-hmm. from Zelda, like the the yeah, Super Nintendo Zelda yeah. feel. Not quite. It had some pixeliness to it, but it also wasn't clearly wasn't hand drawn like Spirit Fairer was. Uh, somewhere kind of in between, basically. Uh, that's coming in 2021, though, so I will also be putting that on my wish list. Next up, we have Subnautica and its expansion, Subnautica Below Zero. Uh, if you've ever heard of that game, it's because it's been out for a while. I actually played it for a couple hours, like, sometime last year. Um, surprise, it's coming to Switch. I, I was telling Jason earlier this week that I just never would have expected it, you know, from a graphical standpoint, which he kindly pointed out if The Witcher 3 and Doom can come to the Switch, then anything can which is true. 
but it comes at a cost because it wasn't the perfect looking game to begin with and it really doesn't look good on the switch either it looks like an n64 game from the trailer that's, like it, that's it really too did. harsh but it definitely uh, doesn't look good yeah but from a gameplay standpoint you had mentioned this was a little bit like astroneer can you uh, expand on that it, it's like a solo version like there were with no option for multiplayer but basically you crash land on this ocean planet and all you have to start off with is your little little escape pod and you similarly have you know you have to have food or have at least oxygen and water maybe food as well and you have a very set a number of recipes you go out and you swim around and you gather resources, which you feed back into your research abilities to get more recipes to kind of expand your little base. And then you can go out further to find out what's going on, except whereas Astroneer was clearly just silly, goofy, fun times. Subnautica definitely has a, like a creepy underwater vibe that comes with like, you know, alien life forms living underwater, like stuff's going to kill you. You There's had mentioned that that was a little more intense. It is. It's way more like claustrophobic. And if you have any, I think it's thalassophobia is the fancy word for like, you know, f- fear of the unknown under the sea or whatever. Basically all the Cthulhu. I have that. Who, yeah. Holy what? cow. I never knew there was a word for it. Oh, thalassophobia <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, dude. The un- the ocean creeps me out and so does deep space. I think it's the openness and the fact that like. There's just so much around. You have no control, like no like safety blanket feeling. I don't like it at all. Yeah, thalassophobia is an intense and persistent fear of the sea. Can include the fear of being in deep bodies of water, fear of the yep. vast emptiness of the sea, of sea waves, sea creatures, and fear of distance <gasps> from land. Text that to me. I need to show Lauren that I did not make this up. Sure, sure. Coming right at you. So yeah, if you've got that, don't play this game. <laughs> okay, I'm it's- not playing this game. I, I'm, a, I'm legitimately afraid of whales. I, you know, I'm not from a conceptual standpoint, but if I were ever near one, I might pee my pants, which is fine because I'd be in the ocean. Well, then that's weird though, because I I see what you're saying. If you were ever near near a whale, like not in a boat, right? Right, right. Because I've gone whale watching before. Now it wasn't my choice to do this and this may Mm. have been where my fear developed, but, um, yeah. Anyway. All right. So don't check out Subnautica. It's a terrible, terrible game. (laughs) (laughs) Next up we have Takashi and Hiroshi. No, Which is thank you. So, oh, dude, it looks so. I gotta give it props, though. Why don't Heart, you like it? Heartwarming. It honestly it looks like something that would depress me. Yes, that is the thing. Like, I, I guarantee the little brother dies in the end. I haven't yeah. played it. I don't know anything about it. But there's a trailer, and at one point, you can clearly see he's in a hospital bed. So it's this. So the game, the story is told through these amazing looking claymation scenes. Or puppets. I don't know if they're puppets. It looks or it's like claymation. it's stop motion animation, is what it says. Okay, yeah, definitely stop motion. If it's claymation or if it's puppets, I'm not sure, but it's definitely stop motion. And you're this older brother who has a little brother, and the older brother's making a game, like a vi- you know, so it's a game within a game kind of situation, an RPG, and he's having his little brother test it, and it, that plays into the gameplay. So the little brother plays, and it's a side scrolly thing. It almost looks like I don't know if you've ever played these kind of like side scrolly auto mobile games where it's quote unquote an RPG except it all just kind of plays itself it kind of looks like that where you just kind of run into the enemy and either you're going to beat it or you're not but you get to choose how strong the enemies are and you have to balance the little brother's stress versus his enjoyment so if it's too easy I imagine he wouldn't enjoy himself but if it's too hard it would be you know too stressful and then again there are these like story moments that you can see where again it's Clearly something depressing is going on. So hopefully it has an uplifting bit at the end, but it does also seem like it could utterly crush your soul. It, it, it definitely it definitely looks like you're trying to entertain your brother who's in the hospital and he's probably mm-hmm. going to die. Probably. And I just, I can't handle that. So that's that's the only reason I'm like, I'm out on this. I can't, I can't handle that. I hear it's short though. So, and it has the air. So it has all the benefits of a walking sim, but none of the negatives as in it actually has gameplay. So that's why I'm kind of like, interested in it because like i do like the stories that usually come along with those just you know cerebral nothing else going on except the story kind of thing but at the same time it's like even when they're only like an hour and a half i'm like oh, this is still really boring yeah it's weird because i love movies tv and books but i don't know when it's a video game i'm just too used to being able to do something so if i'm right. just clicking that button and i know that that's going to be the whole game like i usually just don't want to deal with it there are a couple of those. I don't know if you classify them kind of in the same boat, but like the um, 
another lost phone or whatever mm-hmm. where it's kind of like a mystery and like a choose your own that's adventure that's a little different because even that has more like like you have to make choices and you you look through the phone and like exactly it's a mystery you're piecing together right so. yeah anyway um, i've been wanting more to play out. that with me because th- that's on switch too yes it is i think i've seen that i believe it's out it was out that day too yep it was released the same yep. day so T- you can check that out yes and uh, I'll put that on my wish list, but we'll we'll hold off for a little bit. Next up, we have Raji, an epic, an ancient epic. This was the most intriguing to me of all of them, and the most likely for me to purchase within the next couple of days. Basically, it is an isometric action game with some side scrolling. It had like through the very brief trailer I saw, there were lots of different kinds of action. So you had that kind of isometric, you know, you're just running third person action. There were also side-scrolling platforming sections, and there were also moments where they were clearly like flying or gliding through the air, so it was like behind over the shoulder view, kind of like a Star Fox situation. Um, But it looked really cool, and it's based on ancient Indian Hindu influence. It's done by like an Indian studio over in India, so it's always cool to see some that which you don't see a lot of you know we get a lot of norse a lot of greek mythology but you don't get a lot of far east stuff in a lot of video games um but it was also out that day and i will probably be picking that up yeah it looked interesting i don't know if that that's not my favorite one but i think mm-hmm. my favorite one is probably not one you would consider it indie so mm, yes we will get to that because i i think i had a note about that um but that was that okay, okay so I feel like I was going to say one more thing about it. What was it? Oh, it's also very short. I'm hearing it's only about five hours long. So uh, always a plus, but, but with replay value. So again, if that five hours leaves you wanting more, I'm pretty sure you can get, you know, go back into it and, and explore, not explore, but like experiencing it in a slightly different way. Uh, next up, very funny title, bear and breakfast. I loved that. title. <laughs> it's a really good one. Another little management adventure game. You are a bear who runs a B and B. That's about I, if, it. If, if I was like 12 and had the summer off, this would be my jam, man. Mm-hmm. You, so for this one, it's it, it describes itself as a laid back management adventure game, which is already kind of like, yes, laid back. Yes. Adventure game. Yes. Because um, I, I always get stressed out by those management games unless they're like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and you basically start from rubble like broken down cabin in the woods and you're a bear and you have to upstart a B and B and make it like, you know, nice and start making money. And, and anyway, it, it looks like it has a lot of deep customization. It's got some side quests and, um, I don't know that I'll ever play it, but the name is awesome. It looks super cute and I'm not usually one for cute, but I liked this. Yep. I loved it. Um, that one is a timed console exclusive coming in 2021. So next year. So be on the lookout for that. Next, we have the... Cr- oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say maybe I'll catch a break and get laid off and I'll have some time and I can play this. Perfect. Can't wait. <laughs> mm, excuse me. Next, we have the uh, critically acclaimed A Short Hike. Um, I believe this came out last year. It is exactly what it is uh, or exactly what the title says it is a short hike you are this little bird character and you go on this little adventure through this kind of wilderness-esque area but there's other characters and you know it's not like you're completely alone but um i don't know a lot about it other than that people liked it a lot you know it kind of took them by surprise but it was one of those indie darlings so to speak um and then it also launched that day so it is out now on switch as a timed console exclusive have you heard about this game before jason i have not Okay. All revoke I, it's one of the, like, my indie card. You revoke your indie exactly. It's just one of those games where it's like, oh, you got to play short hike, and then no one says anything else about it because there's not much else you can say that either doesn't sound super generic, kind of like how I just described it, or completely gives away the game and everything that you can experience in it. That kind of reminds me of that other one that I cannot remember. That's a oh, outer gosh. wilds. No, 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 no. It's mm-hmm. one that, oh, you love it. It's an RPG. It's got, you did a, you did a, uh, not a chaos run. You did some sort of run on it. Chaos run. Or you killed everything. Or maybe you didn't oh, kill it. Undertale. Yeah, Undertale. It, Undertale. Like, was... it just, just oh. in the way that you just, like, you can't really say much about it other than, like, oh, you got to play Undertale. It's true. 
you got to play Undertale and it might not be for you, but you do have to play it. Like, like you have to play it to just to make sure that you don't like, I have never been more wrong about a game than I was about Undertale. And I didn't hate Undertale by any stretch, but I didn't get Undertale until I watched a playthrough of it on the, um, on like the, the, what do they call it? The pacifist run. And then I That's did my what own. It was. It was a pacifist run that I watched, and then I did the genocide run. That's which right. Which was exhilarating. <laughs> anyway, not to get derailed on another awesome indie that came out forever ago. Next up is a really cool looking game called Card Shark. Yes. Yes. So basically, instead of just playing like traditional card games, you're this. You know, we're probably talking like mid 1800s, early 1900s. It's hard. Hard to 18th put exactly. century French society. Okay, so even further back, 18th century yeah. French society. But basically, yes, you are a, a a cheat. You're a card cheat. Your goal is to play cards and cheat at playing cards. So rather than just you know playing poker, you're specifically taking motions and completing tasks to stack the deck in your favor. And um, basically, it looked like kind of like mini games where you would kind of do you know like these sneaky shuffles or pull a card out of you know, a sleeve kind of thing. And then it seemed like there were moments where your choices to cheat could have, potentially have an effect where someone pulls out a gun and shoots somebody else. And it's all very, you know, the, the arts, it's not like a big bombastic thing. The art style is very simple and minimalistic, but it looked really cool. I agree. And the other cool thing about this particular game is that the, I think the art director, I mean, it may have been a different position, but I thought it was maybe creative director, whatever. He is actually the card shark. Like he knows how to do these things in real life. And he said he implemented those mechanics into the game. So you'll kind of learn real life, simple version of like how these things are pulled off, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, it was really cool. And yeah, that guy got on and he is, like you said, either the art director or the creative director slash card shark. And he was very French, very, very French. Oh yeah, totally. So that comes out 2021 as well. Next up, I believe, is the game Jason was referring to a moment ago, Torchlight 3. Yeah! How you feeling? I mean, so my here's my history with this game, and, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the people who originally designed uh, Diablo 1 and 2 the left Blizzard and went on to, to, to form their own team, and they created the Torchlight series. And they so did. this is the third iteration of that and it very much looks like Diablo and it very much looks like what Diablo would have become if it had stayed on its trajectory and not become Diablo 3. Right. A little a little cuter. Um not that Torchlight is like a baby game, but you know Diablo is very much what it is with the grim dark devils angels thing. Um but I've played both Torchlight 1 and 2. The company that was in charge of Torchlight got purchased and then, like, kind of sacked. And then you thought they weren't going to do it, but then they came out with this thing called Torchlight Frontier, which was then re kind of like rebranded into Torchlight 3. I think they were going to go for some sort of games as a service approach. And then the immediate and palpable backlash from fans was like so strong where they were like, uh, 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 no, um, we didn't mean that. We didn't mean that at all. It's Torchlight 3, we promise. Sure. And so basically, yeah, it's going to be Torchlight 3. Um, I like the way it looks. It looked like it was going to finally like be at home on a console. The first two were designed with PC in mind, which is fine. But then when you try to port it to console, it can be a little cumbersome. Uh, I don't have time for a game like this, though. I mean, maybe because there is like a heavy focus on like being able to play it solo, kind of like back with D2. Not that you couldn't just like, you know, go crazy on the multiplayer side, but something like D3 was very much like, nah, you're going to want to play this with somebody. Path of Exile is also kind of like that too in some ways. Do you really see yourself playing this, Jason? I really don't. I just yeah. love the <laughs> idea of it, but I, I, I think I will never recapture that magic of Diablo 2 in, in middle school. Like right. I just, I'm never going to have that again. I'll have other great gaming experiences, but I'm never going to have that again. And so chasing it is probably futile, honestly. Um, but this is another one of those games where it's like, if I was 12 or 13 and I had mm-hmm. the summer, you know, off, like this would be my jam. <laughs> I, it's are. this and bear and breakfast, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you aren't never free to play, if you are free to play all the time and you like these kinds of games, 
but you don't want like ultra complexity or even as complex as like D3. Like that was the thing about Torchlight 2. It's like, man, this isn't even as complicated as D3, which is not complicated at all. And I like that. I like that part of it. Um, and I like the world, you know, it's a unique little world. It's fun. Like it's a kind of a vague steampunkiness to it. And anyway, um, fall 2020 coming to switch. It's already uh, out on PC, I believe. Are you sure? I just Googled the release date and it said June 2020. Join early access now. So Okay, I got you. So it's probably early access is when it came out, or is it the form that it's out in right now. Yeah. All right. Next, we had some puzzle game called Manifold Garden where you're like a cube and I wasn't paying attention. Did you see anything about I this? I could game? not make heads or tails of this game. It looked like it was a puzzle game that mess kind of like played on perspective and and physics Mm -hmm. uh and you have to manipulate gravity and change your perspective to see the world in new ways quote unquote to solve the puzzles um it's very out there in terms of the art style if you've ever seen like one of those super artistic paintings that's a, a lot of geometric figures and depth to it that's kind of the art style of this uh but it's in a game puzzle form and I don't know that there's much gameplay beyond that. I, I, it doesn't look like you're really a character so much as you're just manipulating the environments. So not for me, right. but um, kind of neat nonetheless. Yeah, I don't, I don't do three dimensional puzzles. I'm really, really bad at well, that. So. And you know, the weird thing is, it's it, it is three dimensional, but it looks hand drawn. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it doesn't look computer three dimensional. It very much looks like mechanical pencil drawn. Gotcha. Okay. So I don't. Either way. It's out today. It's out now. You can go pick it up. One of the other games that was available at the or during the presentation. Next up, we have a platformer Evergate, which was basically this is our version of Ori in the Blind Forest, like down to every little aspect. The little char- the main character is this white little spirit. Uh, the music was very Ori esque. The designs of the levels look ori you bounce off of objects like ori does like none of this is bad it's just it's just super obvious um it has a slight like celeste feel to it as well because it is technically like set in a more modern space but because you're a spirit in the spirit world things can kind of look a little bit more ori-esque but it does seem like it's going to deal with like themes similar to celeste with you know potentially depression afterlife death you might be playing as a dead kid for all i know it's not super clear to me you're a childlike spirit on a journey through life death space and time there you go and they describe the environments as beautiful yet haunting so yeah i think you're right on there yeah that's pretty much exactly what the trailer said like i said check it out if you like platformers again definitely a large emphasis on the ability to like launch yourself off of things so they're really like either objects or floating balls of light or something that you could go from one to another so you'd like throw yourself so kind of like you know the jump in celeste or even the jump in ori but you would ping pong off of a bunch of them to get from one location to another instead of just like one or two uh also out now so go check that out if you want to but so is ori on the switch well the first one is yes yeah the the first one one is not sure no so check them both out both are, I mean, Ori is an amazing game. This one's probably pretty good, too. I, I kind of want to buy Ori on the Switch now that I'm kind of back into indies and back you playing should, games dude. on Switch. That'd be a great one to start with. It's not long. Like, the second one is a lot longer, by comparison, at least. Um, the first one, I think I beat in, like, eight or nine hours. Not bad. And I did a lot of, like, hunting for, like, because, you know, it's, it's, it's Metroidvania-esque. It's got that whole, like, you know, okay, you got this power, go find these things and get the health. And get the- Which means I, w- I will 110% get lost, and that's going to take me a lot more time. No, the, the maps, no, you won't. You won't get lost. It's, you never underestimate my inability to <laughs> no bet. use maps. No bet. <laughs> All right, then. Then it was a montage that I told myself that I would get the names of the games from later, but then I didn't. So you can go check out all those other indie games that are coming to Switch soon. We're such a good indie podcast right now. Well, we made the decision after the indie showcase, so that's it's a good not point. our fault. Yeah. Then Which, they did their one more thing kind of situation that directs often do with Untitled Goose Game getting co-op. Which I thought was a strange thing to be like, ah, yes, this is our keystone thing. There are this now is two what you goose. Want. Two geese. This goose. Two goose. Yeah. Well, it's like moose, you know? Moose, goose. Moose, goose. Right? Because you wouldn't say meese. You would. Kit and I used to say meese all the time. Well, like you would be joke. wrong. You'd be wrong. 
No, because I said, well, that was our opinion, Jason. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Anyway, that's coming out September 23rd, presumably to other consoles as well, not just the Switch. So, sadly, no Hollow Knight news, no Silk Song news. I'm sad. Poor Karch. Oh, well. Poor Karch. Poor me. Poor Team Cherry. I hope they're doing okay. I haven't, like, seen anything from them. Hope like, they're holding up, pe- you know? Yeah, because they're, like, I'm sure they hired a couple more people, but the original game was literally just three people, which can sometimes, you know, in these kinds of situations, it's a toss-up. That was like, oh, man, maybe that's, like, super perfect for them, and none of this is affecting them at all, and progress is being made as it always would have been, or maybe it's somehow, like, even worse for them. It's hard to say. All right, that wraps up Nintendo Indie World. Back to reality. We're going to talk some more about Apple, Epic, and all the nonsense that comes along with suing everybody over everything. Because we know you want it. Because we know you want it. So, Jason, you are a little bit more up to speed on this, so I'll let you take the reins on what's been going down um, in chronological order here. Okay. I'll give a brief recap for those who have been out of the loop on this. Now, if you've been a good boy and girl, you've been <laughs> listening to this show, then you you heard us last week and you heard us talk about it and you watched the NFTP debates and you, you're up to speed. But if you're naughty, if you're a little naughty in effort, then you don't know what's going on. So here you go. <laughs> That's all we to say. All right. Nah, it was good. Keep going. All righty. So basically, Epic implemented a proprietary payment system which allowed users to pay Epic directly circumventing the payment processing in the App Store. That means Apple doesn't get their 30%. To incentivize people to pay Epic directly, they discounted the price of the in-app purchases if you pay them directly. Apple promptly, within hours, removed Fortnite from the App Store, and Google shortly then followed suit. Then Epic sued Apple for antitrust reasons. Uh, Apple countered by... This is the new news right here. Apple countered by saying that they're going to terminate all Epic developer accounts, and they're going to ban Epic's development tools for iOS and Mac, meaning that you can't... Like, any developer that uses... Um, Epic's development tool, so um, Unreal Engine stuff to develop their app, it now was no longer allowed to be published on the App Store. Now, reading up on it a little bit more, it's not a huge impact because most app developers don't use Unreal. That's more of a like a gaming engine, um, but it's still a huge deal, and it, and it kind of proves Epic's point that like Apple's totally controlling this market and and they're stopping out competition in markets they they choose to compete in and then it's also revealed that earlier this year apple actually filed a patent for a game streaming service that's similar to google stadia so it then ago. now like not it, even earlier this year like i'm pretty sure it was like last week something something triggered its re, re um surgence into the into you know the, the 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 public eye but i think they actually filed that patent in february is what i'm reading which is interesting because it was right around the time google stadia launched and if you read the patent it actually sounds a lot like google stadia like i could not discern what the unique feature was that they were trying to patent based on what the language they used so mm-hmm. now you have apple who is you know, trying to basically kick Epic off the app store for trying to circumvent their payment system, which makes sense. But then you also have them fighting with Google Stadia and Microsoft X cloud over not having their game streaming service on the platform as well as steam. Meanwhile, Apple's filing patents for game streaming services. So to me, it's a little fishy. And I think to anyone, you know, who looks at this objectively, like, it very much does look like Apple's doing what they want to do uh, to benefit themselves. And why wouldn't they, right? If they can get away with it. But I, I think at this point, something needs to be done. And I'm not saying like, 
totally go in and regulate everything and 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 stop the Apple Store from being the Apple Store. And like I said last week and on NFTP debates, the walled garden approach. It, it, sh- it can still work. It doesn't mean that you have to, it's not the wild, wild west. It just means you can't just selectively impose restrictions on companies who are trying to compete in a space you are thinking about competing in, or that you do currently compete in because that is like the definition of antitrust. And that's where it becomes an issue. Um, so th- yeah. those are my thoughts on it cards, but what, what do you think? Or ma- what do you make of all this? Um, I mean, I don't have any new thoughts on it, I guess. Like, that's new information. Um, I don't know how much it moves the needle in any one way or the other regarding a legal sense. Basically, I mean, and you can see that Apple's Apple's um, strategy is going to be double down because right. it's the only thing that makes sense when your back's against the wall, so to speak. Like, you have to, like, come out swinging you can't show weakness, all that stuff that I hate about, you know, the corporate structure, the world, et cetera. But basically like they need to do a scorched earth. Like if we win and we probably will, because you know, they usually do like it's, I I don't see Apple being the loser in this situation, at least not completely. They want people to know, do not do this ever again. And it'll Which, make it'll make it just such a sour taste to ever attempt something like this. I mean, and that makes sense from the standpoint of like you cannot circumvent the thirty percent because, and I said this uh, on the NFTB debates, mm-hmm. you can't sit here and tell me that it adds no value to your product to be on the App Store because it absolutely does in terms of visibility, right. especially for a brand like Epic. Um, yeah, for sure. So I, I mean, thirty percent. You can argue over whether that's too high or whatever, but. The, the, the fact is that the, the value is there. Where I get a little bit hung up is the restrictions they impose on the companies where they're on a, in a similar competing market and they're not subject to the same restrictions. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't like that. I think, I think that's scummy, but I think it's also two separate problems. It is. It and, is. and Epic would use one to solve the other. And then they, I'm still more angry with Epic trying like Fortnite is a video game which we're gonna go ahead and simplify this real quick or we're gonna simplify this completely we're gonna reduce this way more than we probably should but video games are entertainment primarily um aimed at children how by dare children, I mean you minor. how <laughs> dare you you're kicked off the podcast no let me just get through it primarily aimed at minors let's say we'll we'll broaden it a bit to minors and they are trying to influence them through their video game they are using it as propaganda machine to sway their opinion on a legal matter they have no business knowing anything about really or having an opinion on now who are you talking about I'm talking about Epic. Oh, you, you're putting, absolutely right because they advertise the yeah. hashtag free Fortnite on the splash page of loading Fortnite. I, mm-hmm. I experienced this over the weekend. Like I'm going to play Fortnite with my little brother and it's like free Fortnite. Apple, the evil Apple has done blah, 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 blah. And yeah. sign this petition. And it's like, huh, what are you doing? Because like, what like, are you? Like I, I was a bi- I was a big proponent not not that my opinion or or voice matters at all but like you know when people are like oh, I hate the Epic Store Steam all the way I'm like no nah, it's cool I like it it's good this is good it's all right that they're doing this um, even if it's you know to line their pockets and 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 who knows what they'll be you know in three to five years as far as you know their own scummy practices but this store so far I don't see a problem with it they're offering better deals for developers. I'm getting free games without having to do anything. I don't even have to sign up. I mean, sure, they're probably stealing my data somehow. Who cares? Though? Who is everybody it? Who is it? Exactly. Pa- Papa John's has my info. Who cares? It's like, oh, they don't have forums or rating systems. I'm like, I don't use those. It doesn't matter to me. Right. So And so for them to turn around and then kind of do it, again, it, it's not that they want their cut. It's not that, like, like, if all they were doing is like, we just want more for developers across the board i could get on board with that but then like with the they made them that the mock ad where they used apple's ad from the 80s 
to make fun of them in again inside their own video game which again primarily is played by children and and you they can say that oh that wasn't the intended audience all you want but like but it was because they saw it and you knew they would and i it still rubs me the wrong way so i want to rub you the right way karch get in line buddy so let's get into some better (laughs) news out of nowhere left field this happened earlier in the week ghost of tsushima is getting a multiplayer mode based on japanese myths so yeah no one was expecting this it's coming uh for free later this year good guy sucker punch baby yeah it's a co-op thing so no pvp at least as far as i can tell i wanted to get more details i don't think there is much though no it was a quick trailer It was very much more, though. They were definitely playing up the whole, like, uh, Onis, which is like a type of spirit slash demon. You know, whenever you see those really creepy masks that have, like, the huge tusks and stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, And it looks like you'd be fighting maybe monsters and stuff or or hordes of enemies, maybe. I wonder if uh, if they'll alter the gameplay in any significant way. Like, because I'm trying to imagine having played, you know, several hours, you know, probably tens of hours now on this, on Ghost of Tsushima, I'm like, okay, I could kind of see where you could do like a PVE co-op thing, but at the same time, it's like, uh, I don't know. I feel like you'd still have to make quite a few tweaks to it, so I'll be very interested, and it's free, so I'll definitely play it, and we'll, we'll check it out. Great. Yeah. Uh, but we also, along with that good news, have a couple of bad newses. Bad news sure. is, it, depending on how you, you know, interpret it. It's bad news. It's not the end of the world, but it's bad news. So, Deathloop cool looking game by arcane studios um or arcane lion i guess is the full name, or actual correct name uh published by bethesda owned by bethesda i believe they so owned? yeah um so yeah death loop is delayed to q2 of 2021 and here is the statement roll the tape it says we've made the decision to move the launch date of death loop to q2 2021 our ambition for Deathloop is to deliver a signature arcane game that takes you on takes you to never before seen places in a stylish new world. At the same time, the health and safety of everyone at Arcane Lion remains our top priority. As we've adjusted to work from home, we found that delivering this new and exciting experience at the polish and quality level that defines both an arcane game and a true next gen experience is taking longer than normal. This extra time will allow our team to bring Deathloop's world to life as with as much character and fun as you've come to expect from our team. While we know this is the right decision for Deathloop, we share your disappointment and apologize for making you wait even longer. Thank you for your support and excitement. Your positive feedback has helped fuel us as we continue to work from the confines of our homes. We can't wait to share more details about Deathloop with you, so keep your eyes open for our next update coming soon. Arcane Lion. Cool. I mean, I'm fine with it. I get it. This is the reality that we're in. Um, I, I, I have no qualms with it. Uh, and you know what? It's a it's a PS5 timed exclusive, maybe by Q2 2021. Like this was the one one of the games where I was like, "Ooh, it would be nice to have a PS5 at launch." Yep. And now it's bumping out to Q2 2021, and that's one less one, one fewer reason to for me to need a PS5 at launch, which means I can update the graphics card in my PC happily <laughs> and save the PS5 purchase for Q2 2021 potentially. So I'm fine with it. I, I'm whatever. The only downside I can think of is if, for some reason, this allows another game that was going to launch around that same time who didn't suffer any setbacks to, like, steal their spotlight. Because this looked like this looked like a promising game, but one that might have problems, but those kind of problems could then get overlooked, you know, or get a pass, so to speak, from, from players because it's like, hey, it's one of the only new games they're trying something here, but... I um, still think it's going to be one of the only new games. If you'll remember at the I launch of the, the PS4, the, that quote unquote launch window was really long. And one of the mm-hmm. games that got delayed out of the launch window was infamous second son. And it ended up being a great title. And also one of the only good ones available. It also happened to time with when I was like, Oh, I need to get a PS4. Like when yeah. second son came out, I was like, Oh, I have to get a PS4. That's what I got it. So uh, I think this is going to be similar. I don't think there's going to be too many AAA games competing in that space uh, at that time. So I yeah we'll I see think, yeah we'll see. Q2 specifically in most fiscal calendars is actually the end of June. So we're we're still looking at like a 
a nine month window, nine to ten month window before sure. and, it comes out. And summer usually isn't that crowded, oddly, no. because you you would think these games aimed at, aimed at kids would come out in the summer, but summer games are usually like have a different vibe, like mm-hmm. Uncharted Four or Crash Bandicoot or Tony Hawk. Like those are the summer jams that you usually get. They have like a different vibe than the rest of the calendar year. So yep. maybe this will this is has that like spy exciting cartoony spy versus spy spy thing going on, and so it could be a great summer game. Agreed, and it's just interesting. Another one bites the dust, and you know Halo was was pushed back last week. Deathloop far less significant, but still something. Because so that leaves like you know at least we've still got Jet the Far Shore. You know that and Bug Snacks. If Bug Snacks gets delayed, Sony should delay the PS Five. I me. agree. Quote me. <laughs> and then one more saddish piece of news. Sports Story, the sequel to the critically acclaimed Golf Story, was also delayed. No updated release information at this time, though, which is sad because Golf Story is a really great game. Now, is that, that a Switch exclusive or, or what's the story on that? Uh, I don't know. It's on my Switch and it's an indie, so you should play it. But... I haven't I haven't seen it anywhere else. Golf I think it story. was exclusive. Exclusive. Can't, can't talk. Golf story. Yeah, I'm Golf looking story. exclusive to the Switch, it looks like. Yep, not even on PC, so. So I wonder if that means Pres- this one will also be Presumably. exclusive to the Switch. At least in some sort of time, uh, limited time scope. Yeah. But they should definitely open it up to other companies. Unless Nintendo's paying them a bunch on the back end, this game needs to be experienced by more people. I think it's on sale right now, too, if I'm not mistaken. Golf Story. It's free to me. Oh, it's free to you. But yeah, if you anyone else there hasn't played it, uh, I highly recommend it. Very short, very golf-oriented, but uh, very fun and goofy at the same time. All right, Jason. Uh, real short, or real quick, what do you wish you were playing? Um. So usually for this segment, what we do is we talk about a game that's out that we wish we were playing. And this week, I want to talk about a game that's in a closed alpha that I wish I was playing. And that is a game by a Belgian developer, Happy Volcano, as an indie game. It is this wacky puzzle car game that looks kind of like um like a more zoomed out Rocket League where your objective is to park your car, believe it or not. And it's called You Suck at Parking. Um, so it very much is a puzzle game. It's a wacky game. It looks, it looks crazy. It looks zany. Um... I'm hoping to get into the closed alpha. I don't know a lot about it beyond I saw the trailer. I thought it looked cool. Um, I actually saw this on the indie developer subreddit, which is not highly trafficked. Like this did not have have a lot of comments on it, but it was like for the sub ranked pretty highly. Um, but but I looked at their website and everything, and it looks super legit. Like the way that they're doing it and the way that they're doing the closed alpha. So I'm on their Discord now. And I am hoping to get access. And I just got sent a questionnaire today. So I'm going to answer that and hopefully get into the closed alpha here shortly. And I will update. But that's what I wish I was playing. What What about you, Karch? Um, I wish I was playing anything. I didn't get a lot done video game-wise this week. Um, I'm happy with most of the games that I have on my current docket. I want to play more Ghost. I want to finish Ghost. I would like to be done with that before... <laughs> august ends but i really doubt that's happening so we'll go ahead and say before september's over um well that's a good transition so how how far into ghost of tsushima are you i really don't know ish ballpark you said tens of hours like have you put in 20 hours like i want to say i'm pretty close 15 at the least you know i got it like every time i sit down for the most part i play anywhere between one and two hours you know, and I played a few times a week. So, you know, just by the sheer fact that I've had the game for like five or six weeks now. Right. <laughs> like, it would, it, eh, maybe, maybe maybe not as much. I do always tend to overestimate. It's rare that I'm like, wow, how did I put in that much time? It usually feels like more than I have. Well, that's one note for Sucker Punch is they should really, every developer, regardless of your size, should have some way to track how much time you put into that game. Yeah, it's goofy. I don't like that I can't. I, I hate that so much. It's it's not a huge deal, and yet at the same time, it's a big deal. <laughs> like I just want to know. Yeah, it it's makes no I, sense because on, for discussions like these, it's like, oh, how long did it take you to beat this? We really have to kind of ballpark it, and 
why? (laughs) There's really no technical limitation to doing it. Plenty of people figure it out. So, right. Um, But yeah, speaking to how long I've been playing, basically what I've come to realize is that it was a mistake to not critical path this game because for the first majority of my time or the majority of my time so far up until like the last couple sessions, I spent just kind of doing whatever, taking out Mongol camps and chasing foxes and picking up flowers. And I was like, ah, this is fun. I'm having a good time. And it's just (laughs) like you look at the clock. It's like, oh, I got to go when I realized that I had only just um finished act one now i think act one is a pretty meaty act from what i can tell but who knows how you know maybe three at least three because why do act one and act two that's a weird way to phrase it but i'm finding that while i really like the little side stories so in the beginning you it's part of the main quest to at least introduce yourselves to the other npcs the main npcs but then each of those npcs have their own little side story that they want help with as they help you take back the island for the Mongols. And they're really interesting and the characters are really like, you know, I like them a lot and it's nice that they're bite sized, but they're just a little too bite sized. Like sometimes you'll like, you'll meet them up in a town. They'll be like, okay, follow me. Two minutes later, you're at a place. You'll do a real quick encounter. And then that's it. That's all that was. I'm like, did that really have to be its own individual thing? And now I just got to walk over here to do the next part, which might just be the same. Like, they, instead of having nine parts, they should have just condensed it, make each mission maybe just a little bit longer. Somehow. I was thinking that too, because it's it's honestly, like I'm not very far into the game, but it's intimidating mm-hmm. to see when you're only like two out of nine for this yeah, guy. And, and most of them have nine or at least seven or something. You know, like there's a lot of them. Like one character is very much involved in the main story. So she doesn't have it as many parts on her individual one, but it basically equates to the same general idea you get the same amount of time spent with her basically um so so i sorry go ahead no i I, go ahead i was just gonna say i mean obviously that's like an artificial constraint you're putting on yourself because if you're enjoying it you're enjoying it but i Mm -hmm. totally get where you're coming from and i understand the pressure like it's not a pressure that it's a pressure that i felt before the podcast it's a pressure that's like i i just feel like i'm putting too much time into this game Mm -hmm. Um, I do wish that those were a little more condensed. I was, what I was going to ask you is how far down those do you have to go and what, when, at what point can you break away and just kind of do the main quest stuff whenever you want and not very far at all. Like I said, you have to introduce yourself or they'll introduce themselves as part of a main quest, but there's really not that many you have to do. Like in the beginning you had like four major objectives after you kind of got through the tutorial, which I think you have done at this point. I think so. So yeah. basically you go talk to one, two, three different people. And then there's like another couple, like three quest grouping. And then that's, that's really all act one is. Like I said, like if I had just, if I'm just doing these, it is a quick game, but like it doesn't feel complete to me at least to not do them to not see this story through. And again, they, they're interesting. I want to do them. I just wish they were a little bit better woven into the, just to the game in general. It just no, feels a little too hacked up. I, I agree. And here's the other thing. And I know that you're not really one for like you. I feel like you don't really like the phrase immersion breaking. Um, It's not something I typically have a problem with. Sure. Yeah. And I'm not saying that this is immersion breaking, but I find it odd and, it just makes it, it it gives me a weird feeling that mm-hmm. some of these characters are waiting on me to go save like their loved ones and i am screwing around like chasing foxes right so like i have you know the one of the side quests is like you have to go help this character save their brother or whatever and then she's like meet me at this town when you're ready and i'm going around i'm screwing around meeting like 10 other people in the meantime and each of these like people are like, I need you to meet me here to do this really important thing and save this person or do this thing. And I'm just like, I think that's contributing to the, the amount that I'm overwhelmed by this game, which is why I, part of the reason why I stopped playing it. I don't know. I guess it's just all how you look at it. Like I, sometimes you're right. Sometimes it is like, we got to go. I'm like, except I don't <laughs> see you later. <laughs> Time freezes. But, I'm chasing but the, the foxes. But for the most part, like we're in a war. 
and time is of the essence, but wars also move really slowly. And so when you like you part ways because they're going to go move on to check this thing out, you're going to swing back around, you know, the the you know, the in universe explanation is that you're simply going to meet back up with them on your way from another objective, you know, because again, it's a war. You don't have the luxury of just doing the one thing and you're the most important piece of this war. Um so I like even even when the immersion is broken, I guess I have a better way of explaining it, explaining it to myself. And I also just don't go so heavy on the sidetrack stuff. Like a lot of people, like especially when The Witcher was, you know, super popular, um, just the same kind of things. Like, oh, series in danger. Except I'm gonna go play 700 hours of Gwent. I'm like, well, stop playing Gwent. <laughs> stop. Yes. Oh yeah, I uh, I feel you there. Yeah. Last thing I'll say, though, about Ghost, aside from the general good time I'm still having, I, I'm bouncing around on the difficulty. So, like, I, I'll go, like, I'll do one encounter on Lethal, and then I'll be like, screw this, I'm doing everything on easy. And then I'm like, ah, this is too easy. I'm going back to Lethal. I'll just So, it's I've never done that in a game before. I've never, A, been able to, like, so fluidly change the difficulty, or B, wanted to. Like, I've never been in a position where I felt like I was having my cake and eating it, too, I guess, is the way to put it. Yeah. But I got to this part earlier this afternoon where uh, I won't say how or when because it's not especially spoilery, but it's like it's a pretty cool moment. But you get this new stance called Ghost Stance. Woo! And it's awesome. And it's basically your rage mode, <laughs> for a lack of a better term. After you've killed so many enemies without taking damage, you can activate Ghost Stance and the world goes black and white, even if you don't have the black and white thing set. And then, like, every enemy pretty much freezes in fear of you almost completely, but, like, it's kind of, like, slow-mo. And so then you can you just have free reign to kill them in one shot no matter what kind of difficulty you're on. And then when you do the cut, though, the world immediately goes black and red. And it's, oh, it's, like, visually the coolest thing ever. That <laughs> sounds awesome. Gonna, it is. And I'm going to use it all the time. I'm going to make sure <laughs> if I'm going to use it as much as humanly possible. But Very they also cool. introduced it. You're talking about immersion breaking. The opposite of this. So immersion, like to introduce a game mechanic with the story moment and then like really just drive it home. They did it very well. And I was surprised when it happened because looking back, I remember listening to some podcasts and uh, impressions like, oh, that's right. They did talk about this thing, but they were vague about it. And so I didn't recall it. And then when I finally, I was like surprised to be getting a new ability kind of this late in the game. But maybe again, I'm not. Maybe I'm not that late in the game. Who knows? But it was it was really cool. I really liked it. Yeah, Sucker Punch did a great job weaving the mechanic like introduction into the the narrative because we talked about this a little last week. But they did the same thing with stealth kills mm-hmm. and how conflicted Jen was, and then when it actually happened, how like impactful that moment was now after that you know every stealth kills pretty much the same but it it was very neat to see the way that it was done and that's cool to hear that 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 theme continues throughout the game yep big props to the bad guy too koton koton khan whatever his name is i love cartoon khan (laughs) i love i like that character a lot i like the 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 actor that they got to you know I don't know if he did the mocap, but they definitely um, modeled the character after him, like his physical features. He does the voice acting really well. My only complaint is that he's so far away from Jin. You never see him after your initial showdown with him where he throws you off the bridge in the very, very early parts of the game. So it's kind of like, oh, I'm probably not going to interact with him until the end of the game. Because, because they will do these like these cutscenes where it cuts to him, even though there's no you're not anywhere near him. You know, it's just like a third person scene kind of thing so interesting yeah uh what have you been playing my friend so yeah i so i got i have a couple things i'll tell a little brief story about Fortnite. i thought it was funny so i got my first victory royale this past weekend in in Fortnite. Nice. I've, I've never won a game of Fortnite before but it's funny the way that it happened so my my younger brother jude just turned 13 yesterday happy birthday jude Happy um, birthday. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. So anyway, so we play Fortnite together when I have time and when he's on, you know, Vila will be on. Um, and this past weekend, like I wanted to play some with him, but 
Luke was awake. You, normally, I wait till Luke's napping, but he hasn't been napping on the weekends, and I have unfortunately not been able to connect with Jude. So I was like, okay, enough is enough. It doesn't matter. Line in the sand. I'm doing it this weekend, no matter what. And Luke happened to be awake, and so I was like, whatever. Parent of the year here. I'm gonna let my three year old watch me play Fortnite. And obviously, like, Fortnite is super colorful. Everything looks, like, plastic and shiny and, like, you know, vibrant. And Luke was obviously attracted to it in a strange way that makes me believe (laughs) Fortnite's doing something weird. (laughs) Yeah. And Luke was like, I want to watch Fortnite. I want to watch Fortnite. So, anyway, the thing Luke loves for me to do on Fortnite is he likes me to, to drop down, get a helicopter, and just fly it. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll do that. So Luke asked me Saturday morning. Jude couldn't get on. He was he was sleeping in. I, I couldn't get in touch with him. But but Luke was like, hey, let's play Fortnite. And I was like, okay, whatever, whatever. We'll play Fortnite. And so I because it was it was hot or raining, one of the two, either too hot or raining. So I was like, well, we'll play video games inside. No big deal. Um. So okay. So I get a helicopter. I fly as high as you can fly with a helicopter, and I am just up there at the top. And as the cloud closes in in the Battle Royale, you know, it pushes the characters closer together. There's no fuel gauge on the helicopter. You can fly that for as long as you want. So I've, and Luke will not let me land this thing. I, several times I'm like, hey, should we go see the lighthouse? Should we go see this? Luke's like, no, keep flying that helicopter. I'm like, okay, whatever. So I fly the helicopter. It gets down to the last two people. It's me and this other person, and I'm up in the helicopter, and the circle is so, 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 so tiny. And I'm just flying around in like a 10-foot radius in this helicopter. This dude empties every single piece of ammo he has, and he cannot take down the helicopter because I keep just weaving in and out. like it's, you know. And eventually, when I, he stops shooting at me, I land... <laughs> And he's just like running around and I'm hiding behind a tree. And I had, you know, a couple guns that I picked up before I found a helicopter and I got him. And I freaking won, man, because my three year old likes helicopters. I won Fortnite. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Woo, 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 woo. But the funny thing is, is I'm not familiar enough with the controls to know how to emote. So everybody <laughs> who was watching me just had to watch me stand there and look like I couldn't dance or anything. Nobody was watching you. No, you're right. You're, nobody's watching me now. Nobody's listening now except for Sean and Josh and maybe Kane. And, you know, it's fine. Whatever. So I played Fortnite with Luke, my three-year-old. And I also played a little bit of Children of Morta based on your recommendation. And yeah. I love it, dude. As soon as we're done podcasting tonight, I'm going to go play more of this game. It's really Because I'm so in. Like, I get this. It, it's a roguelike, which basically, it would for anybody who doesn't know, that means you're, you're doing runs. You're not trying to progress in a, le- in a level per se, you're trying to you, strengthen the least your roguelike. Character. It's the least roguelike roguelike I've probably ever played. Well, that yeah. may be true. That may be true. There's a lot of yeah. narrative to it, which is cool. And and like once you beat a level, you go to the next level. You know, like it's like there is no you don't actually start over at any. You don't. There's no such thing as losing progress in this game. You just don't beat that level. That's really all there is to it. But that's how, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, there's. It's procedurally generated for sure. Sure. Yeah. And we won't get into a debate about all that. But what I will say is like, I like the combat. It's isometric. It's top down. It reminds me of a very simplistic Diablo. And I'll say that like probably closest to Diablo one or two. Um, and it is neat the way that you have different characters, and as you go through this, you unlock d- your character's level independently. There's a handful of different characters you can run this roguelike with. It's the family. It's the family, which is so cool. Mm-hmm. Every, all these characters are related. The Bergsons. And, and so as you go through each run, you're collecting gold. And when you die, you go back to the family's house, and your Uncle Ben is like the dude who crafts, you know, he's the one who unlocks the skills for you and you can upgrade the family's skill tree. Um, But each character also has their individual skill tree. 
that they can level up as they progress through the game. So as you're going, you get experience points where you can level up the individual character, but then you're also collecting gold and you can upgrade like the abilities of the family. So you might get, you might unlock a skill for a specific character, but then at the end of the run, you can increase the family's health point, you know, points or whatever, or their damage or their swiftness. Um, or the effect of obelisks, which are kind of like shrines in Diablo, where they'll have temporary effects, and you can you can impact how what percentage of the stats they increase. So you know you might start in with a twenty percent increase to damage, and then you upgrade the skill, and all of a sudden it's a fifty percent increase to damage, stuff like that. So and it is cool as you go through each run, you'll find items which then give your character kind of a build within every run which is really cool so as you're going through you might unlock a skill which is like oh well now your arrows have fire damage and when you die you lose that but for the rest of this run you have fire damage or for the rest of this run if you die you're you know you're you have a one-time revival at you know 60 percent health or whatever so it's really neat and then every time you die there are narrative plot points um, and that's what Karch means when he says you never really lose progress because every single run you get a little bit more of the story, which is so neat. It's such a cool idea. Love the art style. Love the narration. Love the combat system. Love the upgrade system. Um, for this price of this game, I think it's probably like twenty dollars. If that, if that could be on sale, could could yeah, I can't recall. I think it was twenty twenty five at the most, but I'm pretty sure it was twenty. I've probably put it in three or four hours this past week, and yeah. uh, at this point, I would say it's it's definitely worth the price. I mean, and it's on. free. It's on Game Pass too. At least last time I checked, it was on Game Pass. So if you have Game Pass, definitely go check it out. If you don't have Game Pass, watch some trailers and consider it if you like roguelikes. Like if you like um, Dead Cells, if you like Diablo, if you like Bastion, it is a combination they, of all those things. D, I would be hesitant to compare it to Diablo really at all only because there is no loot there's no loot whatsoever okay that's because true because of how important loot is to Diablo because a couple other people said it was like Diablo to me and I watched trailers before but I also read impressions and like Diablo blah, blah, blah. I see what you're saying and I see what you're saying Jason and I don't disagree but at the same time like that's a that's not just a it's just not a path I would go down to describe it okay but, and, the, and that's but all of yeah, and all the things you said though, like because the way the map is and the little like shrine esque things, um, and yeah, the character I will say the characters that you get to play they're all family members. Like I said, you're like this family who's got this like, uh, what's the word? I'm like this sacred duty to protect this mountain. And then as you go further in the story, you unlock members of the family, and everybody plays super different. So you might find a favorite, but you'll find at least two or three people that you like. Which is good because if you use the same person over and over again, there's this theme of the corruption um, in the game, and what'll happen is the cur- they'll get like a debuff to their um, HP as well as their damage, or maybe just their HP. But that's a it's significant enough that if you stack it up two or three times, you're not going to want to use that character for a while. But like I said, because people play differently, you'll find a couple people that you do like. Totally. What what else did you play this week, Karch? Um, not just this week, but the last few weeks, I've been playing Chrono Trigger on my Super Nintendo Classic. Um, well, I hooked it up not to... natively, right? What do you mean? I thought you, I thought that you uh, put a ROM on there. Or is I this... did. It did. It did not come. Chrono Trigger did not come with a Super Nintendo Classic. I did hack it onto there because uh, it was very easy to do, and I wanted to play Chrono Trigger on a TV and not my phone. Sure. Um, and I didn't feel like streaming it. So, or not streaming it, but recording it. So I figured, yeah, why not? So yeah, I've, I started this game shortly after Juliet was born. I was doing the whole emulation thing on my PSP, I believe. And I got a bug and it crashed. And I think I just lost all my, I think I lost my save. And I just got super discouraged because I'd gotten pretty far. Um, and, you know, people talk Chrono Trigger up. And like, it's one of the greatest JRPGs of all time. And I was like, I got to beat this game. I got to see the end of this game at least one of them because this game is infamous for having like 13 or 75 different who knows how many there's a lot of different endings really that's insane considering this game came out in 95 yeah it ha- 
it was one of the first games to have like a not one of the first i'm not even going to begin to say that but it had new game plus which was not very common back then how um, how did and, they implement that just after you beat it i don't know i've never done it like i said because i've never beat it i don't even know what new game plus yeah looks it like, said but, chrono trigger and in, in, i'm looking at the wikipedia article now mm-hmm. chrono trigger introduces a new game plus option yeah after completing the game so they they you know built it in there but then it unlocks once you beat the game basically the crux of it and you've learned this pretty early on you have the ability to challenge the final boss pretty early on like you can just go to fight the final boss now if it's your first time through you will get stomped (laughs) duh sure but presumably based on how you run your new game plus i guess and then how much of the game you complete until you go challenge the boss will change the ending at least like the like the final bits of the ending. Um anyway, Chrono Trigger, super beloved SquareSoft uh JRPG. Um the art is by Akira Toriyama, who is famously the creator and artist for the Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z series. Um which he also does the art for the Dragon Quest uh JRPG series. So if you ever look at the box art or the character designs for those two games like, "Oh, those look really similar." It's cuz it's the same guy. Um it's a fun game. I don't know why I like it as much as I do. I don't love it. I didn't love it the very first time I played it. I don't love it now. I still find it to be very enjoyable, probably because of how simplistic it is. So most Final Fantasy games are pretty simple. You've played Final Fantasy VII. There's not a lot to it. You just you get into a battle, you attack, maybe you have some spells, and maybe you have a way to customize your characters through equipment or something else, and that's about it. There's even less to do in Chrono Trigger. (laughs) Like you have a party member, you have a party of three people. You can attack or use techniques, which are also sometimes spells or sometimes they're just something else. Like Chrono Chrono is the main character. Um, He can do like a whirlwind attack where he will just spin around in a circle and, and slash everybody that he catches. The unique thing that Chrono Trigger does that other games at least hadn't done at the time is your characters are, or the enemies are on the screen. And so you can bump into him and then the battle just kind of happens there. Like the HUD comes up and you start the battle. You don't like the screen doesn't go black into a totally different setting like it will in a lot of the Final Fantasies. And then certain abilities, it depends on the positioning of the enemies in relation to each other, except you can't actually move them and you can't move yourself. So it is still turn based, but the characters will move around slightly. And so you can have different strategies based on like aoe moves and stuff and then additionally you can choose these like combo moves so aoe one, sorry aoe area of effect for anyone yes, area of effect yeah so lo- like like this bit like the whirlwind attack i described a moment ago um if certain characters in the party know certain moves they can basically combine those moves so uh chrono can use his little whirlwind c- uh, attack and then another character can use her little fire attack and she basically sets his blade on fire and he'll do like a flaming whirlwind, which basically is just extra damage with the fire subtype on top of it. So if they're weak to fire, it'll do even more damage. Um, And th- th- that's it. That's the complexity of the battle system. It does not get much more complicated than that from what I, kinda, I remember. I kind of like that. It's, it's, a, it's a selling point. It is not a detractor at all because it works really well and it's got all the other stuff. You know, it's got a cute story. Uh, the theme of Chrono Trigger is time travel. Very early on, you get thrown back into the past through some shenanigans that just don't really make a lot of sense. You then get thrown into the far future where you find out the world has mostly been destroyed. There's still some survivors, but it's nothing like it was by this being called Lavos. They must have got transported to 2020. <laughs> it is 20, <laughs> 2300 AD, I believe. Oh, is the okay. Year so we got a couple more years. A <laughs> couple more years. Um, but... The quickly you learn that Lavos is this thing and you now feel like it's your responsibility to stop Lavos because why not? <laughs> it's like there's not a lot of character depth to anybody. Chrono is a silent protagonist. You know, I mean, come on. Very... It was 95 in this one on the Super Nintendo. Like, can oh, you, yeah. like, like there's not a lot of character development in any of those titles. There isn't. But what it does, what it lacks in character development or like strong dialogue, even for a game at this time, like I find it to be on the weaker side, like you just don't feel a lot for these characters. What it does excel at is character design, because again, Toriyama, one of the best in the business, you know, you get a robot guy in your party and you're like, man, I, I love that robot. His name is Robo. 
and he punches things and he's just it's it's fun the characters are fun by the sheer design of them and you want to get more party members as much as you can and see the goofy enemies that you can um that are there in the different time periods like there's a there is a um like a like a prehistoric place where like these kind of dinosaur people rule and humans are in caveman mode and they're stupid and you have to save them from like the dino wizard guy and it's like little bite-sized adventures in every little timeline that you go to with the vague overarching story being Lavos is coming. We got to stop him. This makes me wish I was a game designer in the nineties because I could, people would be saying this about me. They'd be like Jason, Wright. He was a, he was an iconic game designer. You know, he didn't, you know, just the simplicity of his characters. There was a dog named Ro- <laughs> Rover, and you're like, man, I love that dog. He's just such a generic dog. He was a beagle. He's great. He's a great dog. <laughs> this is what I He's, feel like. Yeah. There's a he robot to... named Robo. Like, Technically, you can really? name him, but his default name is Robo. Okay. You, you see what I'm saying here is yeah. that people, people, it's unfair that people prospered off of tropes that existed pre-gaming and now no one can use those really yeah it's unfair props you know props because you know somebody had to think of that right they did a robot character named robo and an rpg and then you know a main character named chrono in a game about time (laughs) um (laughs) i don't know I do not understand the critical acclaim of this game, though. At, at, while at the same time, I I feel compelled to play it because I am, I am enjoying it. There is a, a something about the again. There is this adorable charm to the character and world design, and there is a simplicity to the combat that just makes it easy to keep playing without getting bored. At the same time, when people put this next to Final Fantasy VI, which is like the Super Nintendo JRPG, or even games that come after it. I, I don't know. I'm just like, I guess it was a hat. You had to be there, but like I've played games from back then and I understand why people love that game. Still, you know, final fantasy five is phenomenal. Not that many people were able to play it cause it was Japanese only for the longest time, but still, I mean, very it, good it game. came to the PlayStation 98. It looks like, Oh, it, it's come to everything. It came to the PlayStation. Um, it's on steam. It's on phones. There was a really I mean, good it, it, DS it came port. to North America in 99 is what I'm seeing here. And, oh, are you and, talking about final fantasy five? Yeah. Final fantasy five and final yes. fantasy four came to North America in 91, which predates Chrono Trigger. Yeah. So I would say Chrono Trigger is better than final fantasy four, but I'm, not gonna I, I'm just saying it's not yeah. like, it's not like the world had never seen a game like this. So what I, to your point, what makes this mm. so special? I couldn't say, I don't know. Like, cause like I said, I don't get it. Like I get it to an extent. I just don't get it as far as some people seem to love it. Yeah. Had to be there. Had to be there. Well, I right. will, I will make one last short note of one other game that I play this week. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's, called hunt showdown um and this game has been on sale on steam it's only like 22 dollars right now i don't i don't know that i'd pay 40 for it uh tyler got it on sale a couple months ago it seems like it goes on sale every couple months tyler got it on sale a couple of months ago for like 25 bucks and then i waited on a sale for it and it came on a steam sale which is the only platform it's, it's on it's not on epic games store or anything else uh that i can find but it came to a Steam sale. It's forty five percent off, uh, about twenty two bucks. So for that price, let me tell you about my experience before I say if it's worth that or not. So basically, what this is is it is a squad based online um, multiplayer game. So it, there is no real story to this. Every time you play it, it's kind of around. And here's my understanding of it, which is a very high level understanding because I haven't gotten too far into it. But you are you have a character. You're you're you are on hardcore mode here. Once you die, you lose your hunter. Your your mm-hmm. character is your hunter, and if you die, you lose your hunter. So the cool thing about it is that nobody can be that high of a level. Because you gain levels very quickly in this game. But if you're above level 10 and you die, you lose your character. 
you're gone. You got to hire a new hunter and start from scratch. So basically the way that it works is you you choose a hunter and they are kind of like randomly generated. There is like an in-game currency where you can kind of spend some in-game currency to upgrade to a sl- maybe a slightly better loadout, but you always have access to a free hunter. And once you choose that hunter, it's on your roster. I think you can have up to two hunters. And what you do is you have like a level for your profile and you have a level for your char- your individual characters. And mm-hmm. so the way that it works is as you progress, your, your profile um, level continues to progress. But when you die, if you're beyond level 10, your character resets every single time. And I think the number of character slots you're allowed is dependent on your profile level. Somebody can correct me on that if I'm wrong, but but that was my observation. So the gameplay is that it's kind of a it's it's kind of a battle royale to an extent, but it's super slow paced, which is cool. So you're dropped in, and you'll you'll have a squad like Tyler and I played as a duo. So it's just Tyler and me, and you. Go into you hold down if you're you're playing on a mouse and keyboard you hold down E and you go into like a predator mode and you can see and track clues. Clues are like these these stone waypoints on the ground. You have to travel to them, and there are NPCs in the world that are zombies, and those will attack you. But you're also fighting other duos and other people in the world. For the same clues. So you hone in on the clues. Once you get two clues, you can go get the boss. The boss is a demon. If you kill the boss, then that means you banish the boss. You can choose to exit the game with your loot or continue on to the next round, at which points the stakes become higher. So it's how much risk you want to take on for how much reward you're going to get for exiting the game. And that is the gameplay loop. So it is okay, like a very. So what's the point? What what are you so working the, towards? What, the point is, you collect two clues to banish a demon, and mm-hmm. at that point, your decision is: Do you want to leave with the loot that you have, which is a significant sum, or do you to do want what with though? What do you do? With, what's the point of leaving with the loot? So the point of leaving with the loot is you can upgrade your character's loadout. Is this just a? have fun until you die situation see how far you can get next time i think so okay which is but, fine but that, i don't totally i don't know for sure because i don't yeah. know if there's any permanent progress you can make or if it's once you die the character's gone forever i actually don't mm. know the answer to that because i didn't play enough to know um interesting but what i will say is this is a the the cool things about this game are that it's very much like sound design based so there are strategically placed sticks all over the map. If you step on a stick, that is going to travel to somebody's directional hearing. They have a headset on, and they will be able to hear where you went. There are crows all over the map that are, like, pecking at corpses. If you walk by crows and you startle them and they scatter, that's going to alert other players. So it's all about doing these things that you need to do. But you also have to either avoid other people or be prepared to battle other people to so like a non-traditional stealth. Absolutely. Like, like Absolutely. staying hidden, but then the mechanism which you stay hidden or rather the mechanism which you become revealed sounds pretty different. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that's what's novel about it, which is which is kind of cool. So for twenty twenty dollars, it's it's pretty cool. I but hold off on buying it. I mean, it's on sale at the end of the month. I'm going to play it at least one more time before the end of the month. I don't know that I recommend it at this point, but I had fun with it last night. Cool. It seems like a game I would never want to play with a rando. Um, no, I don't think I would want to either. Although I thought about, I thought about if it, it might be fun just like once or twice, if you could voice chat with a rando. Yeah. Because I kind of missed that about the, like the PS3, Xbox 360 era, you know? Right. Can you can can Tyler turn around and shoot you in the face? Yep, there is friendly fire. You want to be really careful with that. I feel like I feel like I heard impressions about this game a while ago. Like when you st- especially when you mentioned permadeath earlier on, it's like some just kind of clicked as I was looking listening to you, looking at the Wikipedia page and then you said that I was like, "Huh, this this must be that 
game. I just don't remember anything about it. I don't remember much about it either, but a lot of people are playing it right now and it is kind of popular amongst, right. you know, people who... So and if like you look... That, go ahead. I was going to that last part, my last question about the can you betray people, that was a big thing that they talked about because he was playing with randoms. Uh, and sometimes yeah. he'd get like a veteran who would show him the ropes and sometimes he would get a jerk who would just <laughs> kill him. <laughs> I don't know what the advantage would be to killing your own teammate, to be honest with you, but yeah, it um, could be a, could still be a different game. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, what I will say is that I, like I said, I had fun with it. It's an interesting concept, and if you want to play kind of something, it's not a battle royale, but if you want to play something in a similar vein that doesn't have as many 11 year olds who are going to stomp you. Um, and that's a little bit slower paced and a little less cartoony. Like this could be something to look into. Yeah, I'm not going to buy it, but it would be fun to check out with you guys for sure. Yeah. Um, it does say here again on the Wikipedia page that there is a second mode called quick play, which is basically a very short battle royale for that last 15 minutes. And then it's basically like, it just seems like a much, like a very condensed quickened version of what you just described. Yeah, we did. We didn't um, do that, so I can't speak to it. But that's uh, try it out. Kind of bring, yeah. bring us back your opinions. All right. Cool. So we played. Oh, all right, maybe a little bit more than we thought. All right, let's get on to the topic of this show. Yeah, baby. Been trying to have this conversation for a really long time, and I should have cut it any again. But you know what? I just want to have it. I just want to get it out of the way, so I don't have to keep saying that I cut the topic. Let's do it. Today's topic of the show is replaying games lots of people do it lots of people with more time on their hands but we here at never free to play have to be very picky and very choosy with the kinds of games that we replay so i'm just going to open up the floor to you jason did you like to replay games no never i won't say never but i do not enjoy replaying games i don't see the point in replaying games there are there are very rare occasions where if I roll credits on a game, I'm going to go back and replay it. Mm-hmm. Very, now, very rare exception. Now, is this something that you've developed over time, or is this kind of how you've always been? Well, you know, when I was younger, I feel like the concept of rolling credits wasn't really a thing. Like, it didn't really exist to me. Beating a game as a concept did not exist to me probably until high school. Mm-hmm. And I just I didn't even view it as replaying a game if I would, you know, replay a game or restart a game or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um but I would say more recently in like my mature adult state with responsibilities, uh that it's just it's it's more or less a time constraint more than anything. And it's sure it's self-imposed because I could always use the time that I'm spending playing games on replaying games. It's just not like I want to have new experiences. I don't want to just continue to replay the games that I've always replayed. Sure. That, that's a fair answer. It's but, it's definitely not one I feel like most people have. And so I always kind of scratch my head and look at you like a dumb chimpanzee. But I don't understand people who do replay games. Like, like oh, there aren't any good games, so I'm going to go replay something I already put 60 hours into. That I don't... Like, I scratch my head at that. So know. if you could, a, you could shed some light on that for me, that'd be great. I'm a serial redoer. I love to read the same books again. I love to watch. Lord knows, I love to watch the same TV shows again. We're watching Brooklyn Nine Nine again. See, and I, like don't, our, I do not do that. I don't do that. Yeah. I just, I haven't seen. I've seen like three new shows in the last year because we rewatch stuff so much. The only thing and, we'll ever rewatch is Friends and only or The Office, and only for background noise. Never sit down and actually watch it because I've seen it. I've seen it. Like. I don't need to rewatch it. I hear you. And, and you know, we usually do other things, whether that's just browsing phone or, or she'll read or not play a game while, while we watch something that we've watched before. But we just do that a lot. That's probably where I, that's probably why I get so much gaming in compared to you because we watch this where we are rewatching something almost always. And so of course I've got time to like play something on my switch. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense, but At least talk to me wise. about the psyche of someone who would subject themselves to replaying say a JRPG. Like how many times have you replayed? I don't know. 
Kingdom Hearts. Like, talk to me about it. Final Fantasy games. Talk to me about it. I don't. I can't explain it. I just love those games, and I. It's cozy, and I want to just. I want to be cozy, and new stuff is a chore. It's a. It's a chore that's often worth it. But I guess there is a. There's this feeling like if I don't beat this game again. Who cares? I've beat it before. Twice. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I don't beat Kingdom Hearts 2 for the fourth time. Yeah. So I guess maybe that's part of it. I have anxiety when it comes to doing anything new and putting that foot forward. You know, like I am, I'd rather just not do than fail, you know, and, and to reduce it down to its basis, most insignificant way, you can apply it to video games in that same way. I guess I'm, I'm I'm throwing stuff at the wall here. I really don't know. I just, I like to, I don't mind it. I prefer it. And you prefer it. Maybe prefer is not the right word, but I definitely, I'm definitely of the mind that especially a game with a narrative, you cannot appreciate a narrative without, um, not, you can't fully appreciate a narrative without experiencing it multiple times. There are very few things that I feel like I don't have to go back to, whether it's a movie or a game or a show or a book. Like, there, I may never watch the Grand Budapest Hotel again because of it's just that movie was kind of perfect just in that one viewing. I would like to, but I also kind of don't. I don't ever want to like potentially taint that experience. But with video games and most other stories, it's just like, or I, especially with video games because you can play it a different way. Uh, I'm going to use this party member. I'm going to focus on this skill tree. I'm going to 100% it this time. You know, yeah, there's always and, that. And, and that's where I think, for me, the the replay value lies if I'm going mm-hmm. to intentionally replay a game. Like, like, I could go back and replay Skyrim because I can do a different build or I, or Diablo 2, for that matter. I'm going to do a different class. I'm going to... To- I, I know what the story beats are, but this game isn't about narrative. I'm going to go ahead... I'm going to play it a totally different way. I'm going to have a totally different experience, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and th- those are probably some of the games that I've replayed the most. And that's not always the case because there's the, there is the nostalgia factor. Because for me... Super Mario World will always hold a special place in my heart, and that's a game I'll always jump into. And because it's, and especially when it's as accessible as being available in the, um, what do you call that? The virtual console. It's not a virtual console, but the the included games for yeah. uh, n- n- the virtual n- console. Right. Uh, yeah, we'll call it virtual <laughs> console. Right. I mean, th- as long as those are there, like I'm, like I will never not. You, I will never pass up an opportunity if someone's like, "Hey, you want to jump into Super Mario World?" But it's yeah. it's just typically they're not something I go out of my way to do. Um, another game that I've played a lot of over the years, up to a certain point, is uh, Ocarina of Time, and I love Ocarina of Time. And I always play it up to the Water Temple, and then I always contemplate calling Sean to beat the the Water Temple for me because I don't know how to beat the Water Temple. <laughs> it's, it's really hard. not that hard. It's it's not that hard. You shut your dirty mouth. If, it's what hard. was the last time you? When was the last time you played it as an adult, though? Um, I mean, it's been a while. Yeah, it, it's been a while like since last... I seriously sit down and be like, "Hey, I'm gonna play. I'm gonna really play this." You know what I mean? Right. The last time I played it, it was super easy. Like as far as like figuring the puzzle out, it is still easily the most irritating one because of because of the mechanic of raising the water well and that's the thing the most recently that i've played it in that i remember is i played in an emulation and i messed up a save state and i trapped myself in such a way that i totally screwed up the water level and there i don't think there was a way to revert it back to the way that it needed to be no there is there is Uh, anyway (laughs) rabbit hole rabbit hole yeah um what games do you tend to replay what types of games do you tend to replay old school jrpgs really and then god of war apparently because <laughs> i can't like i'm i've only played it twice but like earlier sometime just like a week or two ago i was like man i should play that game again i need to re i need to restart the whole game and just beat you do it. please play it please play and beat that game it's so satisfying and you kind of do have to have the beginning in mind to like the again, the end's not this gigantic 
fanfare of a real like, there's no huge realization or anything but like it is this nice bow at the end of you know it, it wraps the story up pretty nicely not yeah. completely because there's going to be a sequel or two but you really should if you got to play replay one game in your entire life right now it's that game i know i know there's just so many great games so but yeah, i usually go back to jrpgs because again i i am a sucker for the familiar um they're easy like it's like a JRPG is like, you know, all games are a puzzle for the most part, um, except for incredibly skill based ones. JRPGs are not skill based almost at all. And so once you've cracked that puzzle, once you know where to grind and what weapons to steal and what character to play, like if you want it to be a, like a steamroll, it can easily be a steamroll. Um, not a, something you always have your first time through, especially if you're not like, you know, cheating and using a guide. But so when you just, go revisit those, do you ever employ the same strategies in the games or do you try to take a new approach each time? It's hard to say. I have a terrible memory. And so often I won't necessarily remember like what my previous strategy was like, you know, for Final Fantasy seven. Like, did I use cloud to your uh, cloud Barrett Tifa or did I use cloud Tifa Sid or like, am I going to get crazy with it this time? And use Yuffie. And the answer is always no, because you <laughs> sucks. Yeah. Um, See, but, I I just from for me, I just if I'm not gonna get a pretty new experience out of it, I just don't. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do it. They, that's the, I guess maybe that's the thing for me. I feel like, except for in very rare cases, it always feels like a new experience, even if it's not a hundred percent new. Like, like I didn't think about it this way that time, or I totally missed this side quest, or or something like that. Like that, I just didn't get a chance to experience, and so there is still you know a uniqueness to it yeah we just we approached it two totally yeah different just perspectives it's it's super interesting you are way more on on board with replaying than i am i it's funny when when people are like oh this game has a ton of replay value i'm almost always like hmm i don't know if i want to touch that like i i love to just have the one experience with the game and that's you know, like, do you want to go replay The Last of Us Part Two? I don't. Oh, no, not it's, that. It's freaking depressing. But I loved it. I loved the experience that I got with it, and I'm glad I had it, and I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. It's great. I finished it. Closed that chapter. Never revisit it. It is a single moment of your life in time. You'll always remember that one time that you had with that game, and now it's done. Uh, that's... I will. I will say that there's a it's not a danger makes it sound way more significant, but like there's a danger in that. And like 15 years from now, you're going to remember that game differently. You're not going to realize you remember it differently, but you're not going to remember it the same way. It might be negative. It might be even more positive. It's where you get into these, like a lot of people were like swooning over the last of us one, a game they hadn't played since 2000 and what 13. But is that so bad? You remember it at the moment of the time where it was relevant and that's your perception of it is when it was but it's not, maybe it's not accurate like maybe well, like time it, has changed and or or the, the the landscape of gaming has changed so much so that like all the things you're saying about it like maybe aren't true or I at think, least not I in the light they, of modern gaming but, but that, uh, to me it doesn't matter because it was true at the time you know it's but, you, not, but people won't talk about it so that as long as you continue to call like for its time for its time but like when people are like still one of the best game like but you don't know that because you haven't played it in forever so you can't really remember how it stacks up you and know? that's like, fair people, you gotta you gotta put that qualifier on there it's like chrono trigger people are like it's one of the best jrpgs of all time like when was the last time you played it and some people it's like i play it every year or i play it once a month because they're crazy or you know maybe they'll play like a shorter version of it where they where they do beat the boss like <laughs> right, right away but my point is like some people like let so much time pass and still let a game sit at their number one where I say Final Fantasy nine is one of my most favorite games of all time of all time. And I have played it several times, <laughs> probably my, one of my most replayed games out of all the games I've replayed. Yeah. And I, and I think as long as you're talking about it and being totally transparent about your experience mm-hmm. with it, it, it's fine. I think it's okay to have a game at your number one that you've only played once. Um, uh, yeah i'm not saying that's a problem like i said i danger makes it sound like it's a, it's not impossible for you to remember properly like, sure we're well, not all and Alzheimer's that's, and that's where if you're gonna say a game holds up then you need mm-hmm. to have played it recently but if you're gonna say 
yeah, I played right. it when it came out and I loved it. And these are the things I loved about it at the time. And, and, and in context, here's what it did that was novel. I think that's fine. Right. So I, it's just, there. I mean, I don't know. I just, there are so many fantastic games and there are more and more of them coming out literally every uh, single day. And so it's terrible. And I know. And it's just like, I just feel like I, I want to experience as many of them as I can. And if I'm replaying stuff I already replayed or that I already played once, that I already beat once, that I already experienced, that is just less time for me to have new experiences. And so it's here true. at Never Free to Play in the vein of that, I just I just can't justify too much time being put into replaying games. Yep. All right, you told me you said that if you could, you'd play God of War again. And yep. technically you haven't beat it. And you only played it in like a whirlwind with Greg. So it, it would almost be like a new experience for yeah, you. Yeah. I mean, we played like literally 20 hours in one weekend. Right. Which so, is just not the way to play that game. I, yeah, love, I, don't playing, know, I love playing games like that. I know. But I, yeah, I, I, hear, I hear you. Yeah. It's hard to fully experience it like that. Yeah. If I could play anything right now, it just like snap my fingers. I've really been wanting to replay um wind waker and yeah. i'm holding out hope that they're gonna port the wii port to the switch and if they the did wii that port. i would go halvesies with you because believe it or not i've never beaten that game i had the hd remake on the wii u and i mm-hmm. probably got about i got to the first dungeon so not too far and yeah. I, uh, I beat the first dungeon or the first like big boss or whatever um I didn't get too much further past that, so I'd love to go back and replay. That seemed like that would be a quote unquote replay, but I've only yeah. you know I only put in four or five hours into it, so right. And I, and I wouldn't quote unquote. I gotta stop saying that. I say that way too much. I wouldn't consider that a replay because you just like dipped your toe in. Yep. But I would bet that's the best Zelda game story. Interesting. Like it might not be the best Zelda game overall. I wouldn't be surprised if it's still my favorite, though. But that's what I want to decide. Like, I love Breath of the Wild. It's my number one with the little asterisk of I haven't played Wind Waker since I beat it. Your disregard for Ocarina of Time just, just bewilders me. It's too old now. It's too old. Twilight Princess is better than Ocarina of Time. No. Yes. I See, it, it, it's hard for me to swallow that because I didn't. I personally did not own a Wii. Greg owned a Wii. I was at college. He had Twilight Princess. I did not. I did not have enough time to really play that game. It's hard for me to hear you say that and and believe it. But, I mean, I didn't play Twilight Princess. I am, so. not, I am not in the majority on that opinion, I assure you. I am a... But to me, like, Link to the Past, Ocarina of Time, and Twilight Princess are all, like, the quote-unquote same game. Like... They're they're just they're evolutions on that exact same formula. Like here's two worlds, you know, a light and a dark, a future and a past, you know, a spirit and a not spirit. Here's you know, like all these kind of similarly themed dungeons. You get some cool like it's the same game, but more modernized each time. And Twilight Princess is like it's ugly. And again, I wish they put the Wii U HD port on the Switch so I could play it again in all the prettiness. Um but even still, the graphics are a little dated. But it's so epic. It's such an amazing, like, like it's my one of my favorite versions of Hyrule. I ah, I love it. I love it. Mm. So good. But it's not even my favorite Zelda game. So. Well, we're going to have a correction from Sean next week that tells you what the real best Zelda game is. So I don't, for the longest time, Sean was a um, Link to the Past supporter. You know, like that was, that he would, he would, Go to go to the mat on that one, but I don't know what he feels like these days. So, I'll Sean, in. He'll tell, tell us. us. He'll tell us. Tell us. All right. So that's replaying games. Next week we're gonna rank the Zelda games. No, that's what I'm doing. we are not. Yeah. Yes, we are. We're gonna do it. <sighs> well, I haven't played them all. <laughs> I don't care. I haven't played. I played literally almost all of them except like a handful of the handhelds. Fine. And then I haven't played um, the Wii one. What was the Wii one? Sacred Swords, Skyward no. Sword. That's Sky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sky, Skyward Sword. Mm-hmm. Skyward Sword. All right. <laughs> that was the topic of the show. We're going to get to Sean's listener question and then we will wrap this baby up. Sean writes in. He says, Hey, fellas, enjoyed the podcast last week. The thoughts on Epic versus Apple were good. 
I agree that it'd be great for small developers if a 30% cut wasn't standard across ev- nearly every platform, but that Epic isn't a straight-up hero here, nor do I think ev- either company knows quite what they're getting into. That's true. I don't think they do know what they're getting into. Makes you think it'd be better if we had more phone options. Like a Windows phone! And I okay. texted you guys about the Windows phone, and you were like, mm, it's too expensive. Mm, I, I can't just- support my own thoughts with backing it with actually paying money. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Question for this week is on Nintendo. I know that in the 3D era, they have not always had great success before the Switch, with the exception of the Wii. However, in that time period, they have always had their handheld market. Do you guys know how Switch sales have compared to, say, a GBA or 3DS? And what do you think that actually says about the Switch? Take care, Sean. Thank you, Sean. I pulled up some information here because I had no idea what I knew a general idea, but I didn't know the exact numbers. So we will go through um, best to worst uh, handhelds for Nintendo's Nintendo platforms. So first sitting high and mighty in the industry, let alone the handheld market is the Nintendo DS family. So that includes the original fat boy, the light, and then the DSI does not include the 3DS does not include the 3DS. Yes. Uh, it is 154 million units. Woo. So that's insane. And that's global. Boy, that's global. Yes, globally. And then the Game Boy Advance family. So that includes the original model and the SP. 81.51 million. That's not too shabby at all, but literally almost half. I was going to say, DS. I was going to say, that's, that's insane. Yeah. The 3DS still on the market, but mostly out. Uh, you know, it's being sunsetted pretty much at this point. Is oh, at yeah. seventy. They have announced that they're not making games for this anymore. Right. They have. They they are still making 3ds's. So again, like these these sales numbers will continue to go up by maybe a couple more million before it's all said and done. But we'll see. Is uh, it's anyway, 3ds sitting at seventy five point seventy seven million. Again, that's the family, including the 2ds, 3ds XL, and the new 3ds. Um, Game Boy. Now, this, this little graph split the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color. A lot of them don't do that because they are almost essentially the same, but we'll just keep going by this well, uh, table here. One thing to note, they did come out almost 10 years apart. Well, uh, the Game right. Boy came out in 89 and the Color came out in 98. And there were there were a handful of Game Boy Color only games, but again, for the most part, it is literally just the color portion. It wasn't like... It didn't wasn't even have a backlight or anything. Right, it wasn't a significant graphical or hardware update aside from the color. Anyway, Game Boy sold 64.42 million. You'll notice we haven't said anything about the Switch yet. The Switch finally comes in at 61.44 million, so just under Game Boy and then over the Game Boy Color, which has 54.27 million. So if you do combine the Game Boy, Switch is still last in the handheld space. It's doing really well in the console space, if you compare it to home consoles like NES, Super Nintendo, which I believe it... Did it pass the Super Nintendo yet? Did what pass the Super Nintendo? Oh, it must have passed the Super Nintendo. I think it hasn't passed the NES, the Switch. I'm looking it up now. I don't... Okay. Uh, it looks like it It passed the Super Nintendo. So the Super Nintendo sold about $49 million and the Switch is mm. at... 61 s- 61 so yeah it's passed it's passed that but it has not passed the any well hold on how many no i I don't think it has it's basically tied the nes nes is 61.91 and switch it's coming up on it yeah it's coming up on it i'm sure by the end of the year it probably will and the nes before the switch was the second best selling nintendo console because the wii is obviously number one and then but so with the NES all the way until the Wii, every console sold worse, and then this and then the Wii U continued that cycle. So the Switch, the Wii was this odd outlier, and then finally the Switch has like true success. But it's a hybrid, right. and so it's failing kind of on both fronts in a weird way. It's doing really well. This is obviously a success, a success but yeah. if you if it has to be both, and if you have to combine, like the DS came out in the GameCube era, basically. 2004, it was released. The GameCube came out in 2001, right? Or 2000. I think so. 2001. 2001. Maybe 2002. 
who knows anyway it they, they pretty much shared the same <laughs> they pretty much shared the same time frame ds yeah. went on a little bit longer went on quite a while actually because the 3ds didn't come out till 2011 because the ds was crazy successful anyway when you combine even the low numbers of the gamecube and combine them with the incredibly high numbers of the nintendo ds like the switch isn't coming anywhere near that so in some respects like i said it's kind of a failure <laughs> Because they put all their eggs into literally one console basket. And it's doing well. It's very popular. It's got a lot of mind share. And it's only been out for three years. That's something to consider. And it's not lost any steam. But it still only has 61 million sold. And we don't know what the future is going to bring. Like, are they going to continue the hybrid? Will the Switch be, like, uh, sun- not sunset, but, like, will it kind of fade gracefully into only a handheld you know like will they end the switch docking kind of concept and only push the lights and then come out with an actual console that might be beefier i don't think so i don't think so either and and one thing to note on this so it's like 61 million we're saying only 61 million yeah that's three years i'm pretty sure that it has we don't have official numbers for the xbox one but we can pretty confidently say that this has already outsold the xbox one that's true, which has done rather poorly, though. You know, <laughs> like I mean, all things considered, poorly but profitable in all in all estimation. So I think the Wii U is profitable, dude. Like we can't really use that metric. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's true. That's true. But I mean, I, I still my my point is is that I don't. You're saying that it's a failure on both fronts. I'm saying that it, success is relative. Sense. And, you know, in, in three years to outsell a console like the Xbox One that's been out for, you know, a couple of years longer, some may view that as a, as a success. So it just it depends on how you define success. Uh, but, it mm-hmm. you know, we've had discussions around what, software-wise, because software sells hardware in, in, in something when we were talking consoles. And obviously launching with Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey that's that's a knockout but mm. since then it's been a little bit underwhelming and you have all of these studios that were focused on the 3ds and now they're doing what and that's a question you asked maybe last week or the week before like where are the games that those studios are working on and obviously we're seeing a lot of what was going to come to a main stream console but where, what are those handheld developers doing? Don't I mean, know, man. Focus them on porting. Focus them on something. Like, we don't know. We have no insight to it. Um, and anyway, I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and try and pretend like I know how to run a business better than Nintendo. Uh, but it is it is frustrating as a as a fan to see this sort of thing. I think those sales figures are great, honestly especially for only being out for three years. But as a fan yeah, sitting here twiddling my thumbs, yeah, I watched the the indie worldwide showcase thing. Cool, I'm excited about a couple of those. But Nintendo, what do you have for me? <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, so to put it into some perspective on contemporaries and, and competitors, the PlayStation 4, at least off of their Wikipedia page I'm reading, they had roughly 50 million um, unit sold as of December 6, 2016, which is like uh, three years and a month. And so the Switch has been out for like three years and five months. Yeah. So more or less the same time frame to to then have an extra, like, what was it? 61 million? Is that what it was? The Switch is 61 million. So to have an extra 11 with only like a, a couple extra months. Now they do have that sweet sweet quarantine <laughs> that probably boosted sales up a certain percentage but like again the switch was already trending high like it never lost any major steam like year over year so you know in that respect it's doing quite well and the ps4 is sitting at 100 million units oh more than 100 million yeah more than 100 million units sold right now so three more years of switch could very easily do that at which point i would say it would be a phenomenal success but like the bottom could drop out at any point, you know, as you were just mentioning that we talked about last week, like at least in my mind, I feel like Nintendo's always balancing on the tip of that knife. You know, it's like 
the indie showcase was great, but there's still nothing from Nintendo. Where's yeah. what I mean, do they it's, have? It's either timed exclusives or games that have been on Steam for two years. Right. Okay. So cool. cool. <laughs> it's it's I do love to talk about this stuff. I like to watch it. I'm always interested. I'm not a fanboy. I don't I mean I want Nintendo to do well. I'm always asking them to do more. Um and, and this and Nintendo is the one like I am debating buying a ps5 at launch i'm probably not going to i don't feel compelled to nintendo mm-hmm. is one where i always buy the console like I, I i bought a wii u at launch okay i would have if i could have yeah and so like no one can can revoke my nintendo credentials like i like i've <laughs> i've owned every single nintendo console um since i was born and many of them at launch when I was the person who got to decide when to buy it. Yeah. Uh, the so, Wii U is the only one I've never had. Yeah. So my point is, is that it's a fair, I think it's a fair criticism. Um, and I, I just want more. I want, I want to see more. Yep. Be big, Nintendo. Dream big. Be big. Thank you, Sean. Be big. All right. Think big. I think that's it, Jason. Yeah, let's wrap it up, man. That was a long episode. That was a little over two hours. I've I've got nothing to say really in closing. Do you? <laughs> nope. Nope. We're just ended there. Yeah. Oh, here's what I will say. I used um. This is my new camera that I'm using. It's a Sony A six thousand. Get the sponsorship. Um, get this. Oh, that'd be cool. That'd be really cool. <laughs> I've I don't know what I'm doing yet. But I do have, I have a dummy battery, I have a capture card. Um, many of these things are very, very difficult to find in quarantine because everybody, to me, to me, if I met a person and they shook my hand and they were like, hi, my name's John, I don't have a podcast, that would be more surprising than to me than if somebody told me they did have a podcast at this point. Uh, right. I feel like everybody has a podcast, everybody has a YouTube channel, everybody's a content creator. That's what's making these things so difficult to find. I found a happy medium. I made some concessions and got this um, Alpha, this Sony A6000. But it does seem like a really nice camera for app- our application, but I don't know how to use it. So you'll probably notice some hiccups this week in terms of my video. And hopefully as I learn how to use this, it'll get better. That's what I'll say. Cool. That's really it. That's not really closing banter. That's more just the FYI. We don't usually have closing banter. Something we, for the beginning, we did, like when we were first doing this and we were still like. That's because we had that, like, Greg is the worst bit. So yeah. Kinda, like, and yeah. for everybody watching, he still is. We, yeah, just got, sure. we just got tired of not answering the phone. Like, you can only talk about someone being the worst for so long. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Hopefully he actually gets me the audio for this on time this week. It'd be cool. Be real cool. <laughs> Not if he goes on vacations and Yeah, I, I I like how he's like, "Oh yeah, I'll, I'll, on Wednesday." He's like, "Jason, I'll record with you Friday." And then he's like, "On Thursday, doesn't answer his phone." And then on Friday I get a picture to the group text that they're at the beach. And I'm like, "Dude, you didn't know this." Two days ago, when you told me you'd record with me on Friday, you didn't know you were going to the beach. Like, you didn't know. Like, you decided, what, Friday when you woke up that you were just going to go to the beach and not bring anything with you to edit or not give me a heads up? Like, come on now. <laughs> anyway, I mean, you can know, beggars can't be choosers. He does all this for free. But uh, still, I, I can be critical. I'm his older brother. Exactly. It cancels it out. Right. Anyway, well, anyway, you guys all it's it's with this release is on a Monday. You all have a fantastic week. Do the best you can with 2020. We will try, but we are never free to play. I have a mix of like a warm yellow and a bright white. Nice. Are you doing the doing the silence of the lamps? Yeah, thing? yeah. Lauren hates it when I do it. A nice glass of Chianti inside of Fava Beans. I do that when I I do that when I pee. Like I do this weird kind of like sigh <laughs> no, sigh why? stutter thing. Just You're in the like, room by that's, yourself that's when, I, when you that's pee. That's when I let out all. 